Uh, with us in the studio, of course, is uh, Councilor Brad Clark. Brad, thanks for being here today. Thank you, Bill. It's great to be here. Councilor Brian McCaddy. Brian, good to have you with us. Thanks, and uh, former Mayor Fred Eisenberger. These are the top three candidates, of course, as we've looked at uh, the polls over the last little while. And uh, uh, you can dispute the numbers, and I'm sure we will in the course of time in this hour. We have decided, since we're only here for an hour, I've just talked to, to Fred and to Brad and to Brian about this. I think we're going to dispense with opening statements. Uh, if they don't know who you guys are by now, they're just not paying attention. Hmm. So let's just get right down to it, because I've got a lot of things we want to talk about here. We've had our listeners uh, sending in some questions over the last couple of days as well. So we're going to try to cover as much ground as possible. What we will do is I'll direct a question to one of you. The other two, of course, will respond. Uh, try to keep the answers to a couple of minutes so we can get to as many topics as we possibly can. And uh, and uh, try to, to obviously, uh, contain your, uh, your reaction to what somebody else might say to within the two minutes that's allotted for you. And we'll try to keep it as civil as possible. Uh, I know you guys have all done this before, but... Uh, some people love the crazy free-for-alls that you can have, but on radio, all you hear is a conglomeration of voices, and nobody gets uh, their message across, and that's not a good thing. So let's get right into it. Thanks for being here, first of all, by the way. It's great to have all three of you here with us. Uh, first question. U.S. Steel has made it pretty clear that they intend to divest themselves of their Hamilton operation in due course. If these lands become available in the North End, what are you willing to do to obtain them, and what land use would you support for that area? Brian, we'll start with you. Well, Bill, that's a huge opportunity for Hamilton, I think. But first off, we want to make sure the, uh, the pensioners are looked after, the U.S. Steel Stelco pensioners. And that's our job at City Council, the job of the mayor. But certainly the uh, 800 acres uh, down there on the busiest port in the Great Lakes uh, is a huge opportunity for a new industry. So we need more jobs in Hamilton. We need more uh, industrial tax base. So uh, I'm, I'm thinking uh, another uh, industrial use, uh, whether it be heavy manufacturing or, or perhaps what we're getting into more of the these days is the advanced manufacturing, the technology-based. So that's the opportunity for us. Brett? Thanks, Bill. I'd, I'd have some serious concerns about uh, entertaining the purchase of the land by the city. The land, as we understand it from just about every party that we know, uh, are, are, are seriously contaminated. And so the city does not want to find themselves in a situation holding that land and being responsible for any potential cleanup, depending on what use comes out later on. In terms of uses, um, I, I really believe that the only use that the land that, that makes sense given the contamination is again some type of, of new manufacturing industry, whether or not it's a mid-size uh, factory or mid-size industry or large industry, uh, but it, it, it should stay industrial. And Fred? So, yeah, so concern for the uh, pensioners, for sure. I mean, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we don't wish this away too quickly. And, uh, you know, if US, U.S. Steel decides to do that, then we need to be ready with some alternative uh, options. And I think uh, clearly, uh, you know, based on my experience with the Port Authority, they, uh, they're, they're in need of more land. And, uh, you know, if it's waterfront-based, uh, contiguous to shipping and navigation, uh, you know, operations, it's a great opportunity for the Port Authority to pick up some more waterfront land and uh, turn that into viable uh, shipping uh, opportunities. It's been great for our city to have a port, an active port. And uh, how we tie that then to a future industry. And the front end of that uh, along Burlington Street uh, also provides uh, advanced manufacturing opportunities that we can start looking at to uh, bring there. You know, interestingly enough, I, I visited a, a hydroponic uh, uh, growing operation, cucumber uh, growing operation in Flamborough. And you know what? Uh, you could use some of those lands uh, in terms of hydroponic uh, agriculture, in fact, because you don't need to use any of the soil. It's all done on uh, above ground. And, uh, you know, there are, if, if the land is not usable and, and you need to do a lot of remediation, you can actually do hydroponics there as well. So there's a number of ideas that we could get into. And, last piece, uh, you know what, there's also that opportunity to move the rail lands uh, into an industrial area. So, now uh, we've all, all long looked for a place where they could land if we don't cap them over. And uh, if they vacate those lands, that uh, is a clear opportunity to actually move those rail lands off the Stewart Street area, put them in the industrial area where they belong, and then free up all that land on the western side of our harbor for future new residential, commercial, entertainment development. We've got uh, a number of different questions about some land uses in the north end and by the waterfront, too, and I hope we get to uh, have some time to get to some of those as well. But let me try to diversify here, if I could, for just a little bit, if I can use an economic development term. Uh, the new mayor, of course, will sit on the police services board. Uh, uh, as you know, the relationship between the chief of police and city council has been, well, acrimonious at times over the last number of years. When these conflicts arise, what do you see as the mayor's role on the police services board? Is it to support the police services board's decisions, or is it to represent city council's position? Fred, we'll start with you. 
Well, it's really a bit of both. I mean, when you're on police services board, by, by, by virtue of the Police Services Act, you're required to, uh, to work in the best interest of policing in our community. So, you know, you have to bear in mind that... Uh, Policing is a very specified and clear, uh, you know, objective in terms of providing uh, an unbiased approach that isn't uh, uh, hampered by a kind of political intrigue. That it's uh, you're there to make sure that policing is done effectively and efficiently for the the residents of our city. But at the same time, you have a responsibility in a general sense to uh, to um, you know help inform the the broader public. So. You know, I, I, I happen to like the current police chief that we have, but there was some bumbling, uh, some fumbling going on in terms of his uh, approach, in terms of his uh, contract issues. I don't think he should have done what he did. Uh, by, but, and uh, I think he's got some communication issues that he has to sort out going forward. But at the same time, he's also done some great things in our community that, uh, that has moved policing forward significantly and brought crime down. So I think there's a balance of between the two that we need to strike. Brad Clark, uh, you were there for an awful lot of the, the problems that were there. Uh, you witnessed them firsthand. You were pretty vocal about it. Uh, what What's the mayor's role in that? Uh, the mayor's role is really to make sure, and uh, council, to make sure that the councillors have the same amount of information as they have on the police services board, barring any of the confidential information, uh, to make sure that they really understand the position of the chief, but more importantly, the position of the police services board. The challenge that we had uh, in the last few years was really at the police services board, where the conflict erupted. There were um, situations where the chief was was uh, proposing one thing and then we had this division of votes on the police services board where um, they were not standing united behind the chief um, and there were challenges. I think the police services board members need to be educated in terms of what their role and responsibility is. They're not to accept direction from the police chief. Their role is to give direction to the police chief. That's the police services board. And so they're the ones that, that that actually take all the accountability for police services and so the council's role is really to say yes or no to the budget under the police services act that's our role uh, so we do need to have that communications back and forth but we need to ensure that the members on the police services board understand very clearly that their role is really to govern the police department Brian, those lines that brad referred to really got blurred over the last couple of years how do you how do you <coughs> fix that as mayor well, I think the uh, key role for the mayor is is to communicate back and forth between the two bodies, the Police Services Board and, and City Council. And this time around, we uh, we had a real breakdown in communications and, and leadership, really. This is really about leadership, uh, to, to work with the uh, police chief. And, and uh, what should have happened this past time is is he should have softened his uh, his position. Uh, and there just wasn't that direction uh, for the, the mayor. In fact, the mayor pulled out uh, shortly after uh, he actually stepped down from the Police Services Board all together. So this is the uh, all about leadership and uh, the mayor's job is is to work on on both sides and and to communicate with the chief, communicate with council and to make sure what comes forward uh, has been has been vetted on both sides and and uh, that's something that we had in the past uh, uh, with previous police chiefs uh, chief to care is is a, is a great cop He's a, he's a wonderful cop, but his communication skills are a little bit uh, challenging. He's sort of a, you know, this is a my way of the highway kind of guy, and we, we need to solve that. The mayor's job is to work on that. Uh, mind you, some of the people on council have the same attitude, so I can understand why there'd be some <laughs> confrontation that would take place. No doubt. Is there a problem, though, and a related question, though, is with citizen appointees to these supposedly arm's-length boards, uh, where they, there seems to be some discrepancy about their role as citizen appointees? Are they to represent council or are they there to serve on the board, Brad? My position has been clear. They're there as individuals who are appointed to take the information and make a decision in their role as a board member. Uh, the responsibility to the council is to make sure that the people who are being appointed to those positions have the credibility, the ability, the, the expertise, the experience to actually sit in that role. Uh, it's very daunting to put someone, for example, on the police services board who's had absolutely no experience in, in the police services and knows nothing about it to pick up that gauntlet and run with it very quickly and learn that, that, that situation. So uh, ultimately, to get back to your question, uh, I really believe that each person that we appoint, they have to make decisions that they feel comfortable that they can live with and they shouldn't just, just be puppets uh, to the city. Is that a failing of, the, of that system? Fred, you've been a counselor, you've been a 
a mayor. You've seen the way that, that operates. Are the best people always appointed to those boards? Uh, I think so. I mean, I think, uh, you, know, uh, in, you know, reasonable people with good information uh, make informed and reasonable decisions. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't have a worry with, uh, with how we appoint people there. I mean, uh, d d d d we only make one appointment in terms of the city uh, citizen appointment. Uh, the rest is made by the province and others. Uh, our other appointments are actually council members. And, uh, you know, clearly that's where the conflict lies, where you have council members that uh, are torn between their council responsibilities and their role and responsibilities relative to the Police Services Act in terms of advocating for and uh, and working on the issues of policing uh, singularly and solely. So that's where the conflict lies, and I think we need to be clear about uh, the role for councillors on the board, that they are to, to make sure that policing is done effectively and, and in an unbiased way, and that it isn't conflicted, and then also that they, they also have a responsibility to look at the budget issues on the other side, but it, it, to the two shouldn't meet, in fact. I think they should be held separately. But, uh, but again, to come back to these blurred lines, though, Brian, it just seems, uh, and a lot of people were questioning uh, the, 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 the elements uh, in some of these boards and saying, well, are these the right people that are being appointed? Let's face it, mm -hmm. if you look at the pedigree, and I don't want to get into names here, of some of the people that are appointed as citizen members of these boards. Uh, they tend to be people that have worked on some of the councillors' campaigns or been contributors to their campaign. Is that the criteria that's being used here? I don't think so, Bill. I mean, and we, uh, if there's a perception that that's the case, we need to fix that because they, these people need to be seen to be neutral and reflecting the uh, the general public. Uh, but to me, the the big issue with the police services board at the moment is the culture that's evolved. It's an us and them culture. Uh, all the provincial appointees have been supporting the chief. Uh, a number of the councillors have been supporting the city council perspective in terms of the budget challenges we've had with uh, with Hamilton Police. So it's it's a much deeper issue at the moment. Uh, it, it's uh, you know us first is them? Are you, are you with the chief or are you with city council? And we can't have a, a police services board that is d divided in that way. So again, the mayor's job is, is to work on, on that culture, to uh, to make sure the communication is uh, proper. They're all working for the greater common good. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left before we have to go to break. I want to get into one other thing. There's a couple of issues here I want to talk about about chemistry on the council, and we're going to certainly get into that as well. Uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce, I wanna, let me get this one in, hopefully, before we finish off the break here. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce and a number of Golden Horseshoe municipalities, including Hamilton, have endorsed the need for the Mid-Pen Highway as an essential tool for goods movement for the Hamilton and Ontario economies. As mayor, will you champion the construction of the Mid-Pen Highway? Uh, Brad, we'll start with you. Yes, I will, and I have throughout my eight years as a councillor. It's, it's, uh, we, we desperately need an alternate route from Niagara to the Hamilton area or to the KW area in this case. Uh, every time the QEW uh, gets bogged down because of an accident, those uh, vehicles are leaving the road and headed into municipal territory. territory. Uh, in terms of trade movement and goods movement, you can see just along the Red Hill and the Link, there's a significant increase in the number of trucks. So uh, the trade coming over that border is significant. Um, the mid Pen or the GTA, uh, um, you know, Niagara Highway uh, was really designed to take that load. Um, the EA that the province did says that we're going to need that by 2031, and, and yet there's still people saying that we don't need it at all. Brian McCaddy. Yeah, I was involved in the earlier provincial uh, discussions on this, and, and the provincial government has said that uh, we don't need the mid-pen at this point in time. It may be a future orientation. What we need to do right now is, is much less expensive uh, activities of trying to shift a lot of the uh, the vehicle traffic, the, the private automobiles, uh, those of us who drive, uh, into other modes, so transit and, and other ways of moving, better uh, go train system, and to make the, the actual lane kilometers on the QEW on the 403 more more available for trucks uh, for goods movement. Uh, that's that's the way to go, and, and we're talking about expanding the Highway 403 uh, through Hamilton, which absolutely needs to happen. That's a parking lot in the morning, and uh, we need to get those people on go trains, uh, go train service, so the goods movement can happen, uh, the trucks can happen a lot easier. So, certainly not for now. Fred Eisenberger. So I, I agree with the uh, provincial position that uh, not at this point. Uh, there's uh, there's other capacities where we can actually uh, make some inroads. Uh, we can uh, we can do a better job of shipping and moving goods. Uh, locally here on the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, what do they call that the uh, 
Short sea shipping. Sorry, it's a difficult one to say. Every time I say it, I, I think of seven silly seamen sailing the seven seas. But I got that one out. The short sea shipping is a real opportunity for us to do movement of goods uh, and get some trucks off the highway. Uh, how do we uh, how do we uh, uh, increase our rail capacity and uh, utilize that better than we have in the past? And I think that's what the province is talking about: is using that capacity first. Uh, maximizing that capacity and then looking at what our future needs are going to be. So I, I agree with the province, not at this time, but uh, maybe down the road. All right, let me do a short time. We'll continue with our uh, debate uh, with uh, the three main contenders, of course, from Air for the City of Hamilton, Brad Clark, Fred Eisenberger, Brian McCaddy. Back after this on the Bill Keller Show on CHML and Cable 14. <laughs> Welcome back. Bill Keller Show, 900 CHML. You're watching on Cable 14. The Mayor's Debate, Brad Clark, Fred Eisenberger, Brian McCaddy here in studio for the next half hour. And uh, we will uh, try to cover as many issues as we can and get their perspectives on those. Thanks so much for being with us, uh, gentlemen. Uh, we'll continue with uh, the questions that have been uh, sent to us by our listeners over the last couple of days. Uh, all of you have promised to hold the line on taxes, suggesting that any tax increase should probably be limited to the rate of inflation. And now that sounds all well and good, but that's not going to generate the revenue for the enormous infrastructure deficit or the massive investment that is needed for public transit. Isn't it time to stop patronizing taxpayers and have a realistic discuss discussion about just how much money we have to raise and how to raise that revenue that we need to be sustainable as a city? And we'll start with Fred Eisenberger. Well, I mean, on the transit side, uh, you know, what we're talking about is something that uh, that ought to be and I think will be ultimately 100% funded by the province. So it's not a local tax base issue. I think, uh, you know, this is provincial funding and uh, and we're already paying for projects that are happening uh, throughout Ontario through our provincial tax dollars. So, you know, we want to make sure that we get our fair share investment here. Beyond that, we need, uh, you know, why, why we started an aggressive uh, economic development drive seven years ago, doubled the budget for the department, uh, was for the very reason that we needed to generate more revenue through new business opportunities and new jobs. Uh, that's our biggest issue. We're, uh, we're now 80% reliant on the residential tax base and 20% uh, comes out of the commercial industrial. That used to be 60-40 and, uh, and we need to turn that around and we also need the jobs that go with it. So there's a lot of revenue raising that we need to do and, and uh, certainly uh, public transit investment is part of that. Uh, but, uh, you know what, we also need to be efficient in terms of how we deliver services. And, you know, there's a report uh, on the table uh, at uh, City Hall right now that has about 100 recommendations in it about how we can do better in terms of delivering services. About two or three of them have been enacted. Uh, we need to get at the rest of them. Brad? Same question to you. Uh, I, I, everybody loves lower taxes. That, that puts a smile on everybody's face. Nobody wants to knock on somebody's door and say, I'm going to raise your taxes. But we're not even making a dent in this infrastructure deficit the way things are going now. Thank you. It, we, it's essential that we freeze non-priority spending, that we really control our costs and make sure that what we are spending on, our money on, are the needs of the community and not necessarily the wants. Uh, and that's what you do when you're in a situation where we have uh, such a, an infrastructure deficit that is, you know, $200 million a year. That's a significant number. And so you, you quite literally have to put all hands on deck to address that issue and make it that priority. We can't have spending where money's being spent, uh, you know, for example, uh, the area rating funds um, on things that are not road and sidewalk related. It's just unacceptable. Uh, the, the people continually tell us what the priorities are. In terms of, of revenue, uh, the new revenue streams that come in from um, uh, market value assessment uh, increases as well as uh, new businesses that are coming in, they actually assist us in in paying for those infrastructure deficits. So uh, we need to make sure that we're approaching it in, in a balanced way. Um, and uh, there, that, that report that was handed to Councillor McCaddy and the rest of the council and I, there was a lot of recommendations in that report and some of them were pretty draconian and some of them were items that, that involved um, widespread privatization. Um, the council is not interested in going down that road. They've made it very 
pretty clear uh, from day one. So we implemented and continue to implement things that provide efficiencies without cutting services. Uh, listen, I've, I've heard every time we talk about transit about this this council position about 100% funding from the province, yada, yada, which is a five-year-old province from a guy that's not even in government anymore. 100% funding from transit does not include operating costs. You mentioned last week, Brian, that it probably doesn't even include the infrastructure refinements that are going to have to happen. Where do we get the money? Isn't it time we start having a discussion about possibly having to raise taxes to do the sorts of things that everybody's promising? Well, I don't think we're we're at the point where we can raise uh, taxes with existing uh, Hamiltonians. Uh, we're still uh, the report we received in August of this year, the tax competitiveness study showed that Hamilton is still 10% over our comparators uh, when it comes to the uh, the residential taxes. So I think we need to look at uh, new revenues uh, for the city. So as new businesses, uh, we need to grow our population. So new new Hamiltonians versus the existing folks, but we need to make the, the investments. Uh, the LRT an investment. Uh, over 100 uh, new buildings uh, are to be built as per the Canadian Urban Institute report that was done. So those are new tax revenues. Uh, so that's, that falls into the category of investment. So we know that the, the province has committed to 100% provincial funding. They just haven't talked about for what or for how much. Uh, the operating cost is something that council is going to have to investigate if the province comes back and says here here's the money, here's part of that $15 million that uh, you rode here in Hamilton. I would suggest rode here in Hamilton. Uh, in terms of this, uh, the subsurface infrastructure, uh, that's stuff we have to do anyways in the next 10 years or so. It's, it's 80, 90 years old, and we've got to fix that. The LRT provides us the impetus to, uh, to fix the underground. Of course, we get a lot of development charges from the new development as well, and the development charges will pay for a lot of the underground uh, redevelopment. Here's the problem, though. Every time we have this discussion, whether you're pro or anti-LRT, and people seem to want to polarize this discussion, even if the government comes in here on October the 28th and said, okay, we're going to fund this thing 100%, whatever the hell that means, it's not going to happen. It may not even happen during this term of office. Uh, you know, since we seem to elect new mayors every four years, uh, it may not happen during your term of office. What are you going to do in the meantime? I mean, instead of holding out and saying all this development is going to happen once this thing is built, that could be 10, 15 years into the future. We're not having a discussion about now. The big numbers that we talked about are now. Fred? Well, there have been improvements in the transit system. Uh, you know what? Uh, Council, to their credit, uh, improved the transit uh, on the mountain and on Rymel Road and uh, improved connectivity to downtown. And that, that's an ongoing process. That's something that needs to keep happening. Uh, and when we're talking about uh, enhanced public transportation, I mean, I, I, I maintain that we, you know, there's a lot of confusion in the broader community about what all that means. Uh, you know, some people have had multiple positions on this. I understand the confusion. I think we need to sort through that confusion and get people uh, really clear and uh, and. and uh, you know, definitive information about what the differences are between all the options, and then really lay out uh, how it's uh, a benefit, to what the return on investment is for the city of Hamilton, and get a community for kind of set consensus on where we need to go. That's what the province is waiting to hear. What does Hamilton really want? And then uh, ultimately, I believe that the province will fund. Brad, uh, what I'm hearing on this program is people are saying, don't tell me what you're going to do in 10 or 15 years. What are you going to do tomorrow? And that's what my smart transit plan addressed. Um, my opponents have not addressed the, the reality that light rail transit, if it was approved, would be way out 10, 15 years before we actually saw it. Um, they have not addressed the fact that the report indicates that we need an 8% eight, 8% increase in transit ridership in order to make the LRT a success. Um, they, I'm pleased that Councilor McCaddy has now admitted that the capital costs are going to be an issue for the city. The development charges, um, the projected development charges are $30 million over 15 years. That's hardly going to pay for those uh, pipes and sewers under the ground. So I've been very straight with the public and providing real substantive numbers in terms of what actually is happening and suggesting that that in order for us to go to a higher order transit like LRT, we need to expand our service across the entire city. We need to improve our bus rapid transit system. We need to add additional bus rapid transit and have a plan over an eight year period. And that's what smart transit does. Brian, uh, again, what, what happens now? I mean, it's great to say for what's sure. going to happen in 15 years, but now? 
Bill, the LRT is just one project, and we spent far too much time during this election talking about it. There's a council position. The province knows that at some point they're going to get back to us and tell us whether we have the money or not. It's not a big issue. The, the issue is what are we going to do now. And and over the last three years, so we've had over a billion dollars in building permits, uh, and uh, development is happening in Hamilton. We're, we're expanding into Ward 3. Uh, McMaster Innovation Park is going great guns uh, in the west end of the city, Hamilton Health Sciences. So we we are moving ahead as a city. Uh, LRT, I believe, would, would fast forward us. But if we don't get LRT, it's, it's not a big problem. We have lots of great stuff happening in this city, and we need to expand the business parks south of the city. We need to service those. Uh, Ancaster Business Park's pretty much built out as we speak. Red Hill Business Park is next. Uh, the Airport Employment Growth District uh, follows that. Mm. So there's lots of, lots of arrows in the quiver uh, to, to move ahead. Uh, LRT is only just, just a part of that. Uh, related issue. I, I mentioned to my listeners a couple of weeks ago, but a Saturday morning when I ran into three guys from uh, Tim Hortons, uh, they were all living on the mountain residents. Uh, and they started going off on me about uh, about some of the transportation problems that were going on on the mountain. It kind of reminded me of days on city council, as a matter of fact. Uh, these guys bent my ear for about half an hour. But I'm hearing from more and more mountain residents now who feel that their transportation needs are not be, or are not being uh, paid attention, that there, there just doesn't seem to be any resolution or any attention being paid to these. Uh, they say there's gridlock every morning and afternoon on the link. There's gridlock on the mountain access routes, on Upper James, on Rymel Road. Yet the focus of just about every transportation discussion in the city is always the downtown. What do you propose to do for mountain residents? Brad, we'll start with you. Yeah, if, if folks go to my website and check out my platform, there's an item there, which is a new deal for Hamilton that addresses that issue. Uh, we have serious congestion on the Red Hill and the Link. We are already at 85% capacity of something that uh, was supposed to meet full capacity somewhere around 2031. So to wait until 2031 to add an additional lane to the highway um, is not really going to solve our issues. It's, it's, it's really problematic. So the real solution is to talk to the province about the fact that the Red Hill and the Link have now really they're operating as a 400 series highway. It, it's a link between the 400 and the QEW. Every single day we see the traffic. Every single day we know it's not all regional traffic. Uh, it's certainly not inter-regional traffic. It is traffic that's coming off the highway and going down to Niagara or going back up to the 403. So given that that's the case, the province, uh, we need to sit down and talk to the province about assisting us with the expansion of the highway and assisting us with the operating costs. We can't do it alone. Brian McCaddy, <coughs> Brian, what are your Bill, thoughts on this? Yeah, thanks, Bill. I, I've got a four-part transit plan, and, and number one is, is more local transit investment, and I asked for a 10-year uh, transit investment uh, strategy through a motion I moved last year, and of course, Council this past uh, budget year, 2014, invested a million dollars in, in new Rymel Road and Stone Church uh, bus service right on the mountain. So we need much more of that kind of service on the mountain. The second part is to enhance the A-Line bus. We do have an A-Line bus that travels uh, James Street from the lower city up to Upper James. Uh, that needs to be enhanced, uh, much more like the B-Line bus we have today. Uh, folks on the West Mountain in Ancaster in particular that have to deal with a 403, they need a way to, to drive to a, a carpool just off the link and to take the bus down to our GO train uh, station uh, at James Street South now, the brand new GO train station which will come on with full go train service in the next little bit on james street north that's the way to move people uh with with better transit on the mountain better connections to the uh, go train uh, systems and to deal with the uh, 403 parking lot issue fred eisenberger fred talk to me about mountain congestion what you want to do about it so clearly i mean uh, transit is is part of the solution but it's not the only solution and you know what uh you know we've we uh, we held up the uh, the building of the expressway and the link for uh, for many decades, uh, unfortunately, due to the work of some that were adamantly opposed to having that happen, and has briefly, recently decided to drive on it. Uh, you know, there's a capacity issue there now, and you know we're almost looking at a need for an additional lane uh, on both. Uh, quite frankly, and, and if you look at the 403 issue, uh, you the know, original design now, did have an extra lane. Didn't it, it did, it, it did, and, and, and you know the argument that uh, the, some of the opponents make was, well, we made it better by making it smaller. When in fact uh, now we're looking at a situation <coughs> where smaller is actually hurting uh, our congestion issue and making, making uh, all kinds of con 
pinch points, uh, both at the 403 and the QEW. Uh, we need a solution on the 403 side. I know the province is looking at it currently. You know, you can engineer and uh, additional capacity there. Uh, it, Go Transit isn't the only solution. It's part of the solution, and we need a balanced approach here. We're not, we're not going to eliminate all the cars that are out there. What we need to do is provide options in terms of mobility for people that looks at all of our transportation capabilities and creates a sense of balance in terms of how we can make them all work for us to provide uh, mobility options for people throughout our community. Uh, doing all transit is not the answer. Doing all roads isn't the answer. We need to, we need to merge both of them and make, uh, make sense out of both so we can use all of that mobility to move people. Okay, we're running a little short on time, and i got a number of things I want to throw together here, so we'll try to do some quick hits here and try to keep your, your answers brief. Uh, we mentioned earlier in the program about a proposed waste gasification facility that's being proposed for the North End. Uh, I know it's uh, an issue. I, I'm hearing a lot of misinformation about this. Uh, let's get a, a straight up and down on this. Are you for this or against this proposal? We'll start Brian McCaddy. Brian? Bill, uh, I think the, pre the reason people are confused is there's been l very little information on it. Uh, we've had it at the Board of Health and uh, lots of gaps in information. The issue for me is it's it's not what we want in Hamilton uh, in terms of our image. For for so many years we've been uh, viewed as the you know the, the dirty uh, air pollution city and and uh, that's what people see from the skyway when they go over. We need to change the image of this city and adding a gasification plant attracting waste from uh, outside the city, which is the only way they're going to be viable if they actually build one the size of what they're suggesting is is just not where we want to go as a city additional air pollution problems so i'm against it fred eisenberger fred so, you know, one of the hallmarks of the People's Platform was uh, making evidence-based decisions. And clearly, uh, you know, just to dismiss things and be opposed is fairly easy to do, uh, based on basing, you know, things on perception. But the reality is that we are currently putting uh, all of our waste uh, into a landfill. Uh, the, the parts that we don't recycle goes into a landfill. And the, the air emission issues and the uh, groundwater issues that come out of landfill are actually much more severe than we may, may get out of a gasification plant. So I'm prepared to look at it, and I think it's, uh, I think it's realistic that, uh, that we understand what the, the capabilities of that system is. It has to be clean in our city. We cannot afford to have another polluter in our, our city of Hamilton. And, and I know, and I visited them, there are uh, numerous uh, you know, communities in Europe, uh, all over Europe, in fact, that are using this technology and generating energy from that as well. So just to say it's gasification isn't the whole picture. You're, you're actually generating ener energy from your waste and if you can do it cleanly, that's a smart thing to do. And Brad, Brad Clark, your thoughts on this? Yeah, thank you. It was an item in the People's Platform, and both of my opponents indicated, well, one indicated that they were 98% supportive of everything in the document. The other indicated 99%. They never indicated exactly what they didn't support or what they did support. Well, they didn't ask. The, the challenge, actually, they did. They gave us a questionnaire to fill out. I feel um, the, the, the real challenge um, on the gasification is people are playing politics with it. One is playing politics to the business community, saying, I want to look at it and and, mm -hmm. and, and and leading that that charge from that side. The other one is saying, no, I'm opposed to it. But the, the truth is, the council doesn't have a decision on it. The council cannot say yes or no to the gasification plant. We have no authority in law to say no to the gasification plant. All we can do is approve zoning one way or the other. And we don't even know yet whether or not it is the zoning is correct for the use or not. We haven't seen that report and we haven't had that discussion. So it's, it's really premature for people to be jumping on the bandwagon either way. And the truth to the constituents is important. They need to understand that city council cannot say no to the gasification plant. They have no authority to do that. Uh, we got about a minute left, a minute and a half or so, so let me quickly go around the table on an issue that four or five people actually brought to our attention, uh, and that is the idea of looking for efficiencies and trying to keep costs down. Will you, as mayor, uh, consider, uh, once again, the possibility of privatizing certain city services to try to reduce costs? Uh, we'll start with Fred Eisenberger. Well, it's not a cookie-cutter issue for me. Uh, you know what? Uh, I've been accused by uh, the McCaddy campaign of looking at privatizing and you know what, uh, I, I, we have, uh, privatization needs to be defined, first of all. Uh, I don't support uh, selling off our assets in any way, shape, or form. That's really what privatization is. Like the 407 was sold off by the Harris <coughs> government, uh, you know, and that uh, short-term gain, long-term pain in terms of we don't get revenue from that anymore. So I would say uh, I, I want to look at every issue and, and do what has the best value for our taxpayer. Brad Clark, Brad? 
Yeah, I, I don't recall actually supporting any privatization in my public uh, career. The real challenge for uh, privatization is making sure that there's a benefit to the actual taxpayer. Uh, so there's sometimes a... Um, a short-term gain, but there's a long-term loss of control on things. Uh, so we need to really be careful when we're looking at privatization. Brian McCaddy, Brian? Well, certainly not when it comes to core public services like our drinking water. Uh, Mr. Eisenberger was a, a lobbyist for American Water uh, when they, they were wanting to keep the service we had privatized uh, in the that's early 2000s. Privatized. I was part that's of the first council to, clear. to bring that back uh, in-house uh, as, as a key service. So drinking water and issues like that, we need to, uh, to remain uh, in a public service. Uh, I supported bringing uh, waste management back in-house 100% as well with our own city services, our city forces. Uh, so I, I can see very few situations where privatization makes sense for, for a municipality. Uh, we have about uh, a minute and a half left, and uh, we can divvy that up for about 40 seconds each for, uh, for final comments among the three of you. Brad, we can start with you. Yeah, I just encourage the residents to really look at the platforms of the three uh, candidates who are running for mayor. Mine is substantive. It has real serious um, uh, decisions that are offered to, to provide solutions. Um, and if folks are really considering going back to the past, if they're considering voting for Mr. Eisenberger, just remember that it's kind of like watching the Titanic movie and hoping for a different ending. Fred? So who knew that was going to happen? Now, you know, clearly, uh, we, you know, people don't want divisive and derisive politics. They want, uh, they want leadership that, uh, that they can trust, uh, leadership that has clear positions and uh, has a vision for the future, uh, that, uh, that has a positive aspiration and ambition. So I'm, uh, I, I'll continue with a, a positive vision for our city. I think uh, people want to be able to uh, know that uh, who they're electing uh, they can rely on, and uh, I have the experience you can count on and leadership you can trust. Vote for me on October 27th. And Brian. Bill, this uh, campaign has been about many things. Uh, someone have you believe the time isn't right to dream big, that dreaming is for later. Uh, in my view, uh, Hamilton's on the cusp of being one of the one of the great cities in our country. We need to join the other cities across the country, and, and the time is now. So we need to, to believe in ourselves if we want others to, to believe in us. And, you know, I believe in Hamilton. It's, it's a, uh, a city that's just uh, taking off the 100-day tour I did, 190 neighborhoods. Hamiltonians uh, are excited about but our city, so we need to move forward with a new mayor for a new Hamilton. Gentlemen, thank you, uh, one and all, for being here today and uh, for the uh, the hard work that's gone into the campaign. Uh, I can't tell you the number of emails I've received that uh, that suggest that all three of you have raised the level of the debate, and we uh, we concur with that. Thank you so much for being here Thanks, today. Bill. Good to have you with us, Thanks. Thanks, Fred Bill. Eisenberger, Brian McCaddy, and Brad Clark. And uh, we will do the break. Come right back to Bill Kelly Show on CHML and Cable 14. <laughs>